All right, welcome everyone to our webinar titled Birds on the Move, Mobile Housing for Poultry on Pasture. And this is presented by Homer Walden, Terrell Spencer, and Christine Deck, and it's hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACS Associate Director, and I also direct our Fund a Farmer project. I'll be moderating the webinar today. Thank you all for joining us. So just a few introductions. Fact, uh, Food Animal Concerns Trust, we are a national nonprofit organization that promotes humane farming and advocates for the safe production of meat, milk, and eggs. We also help consumers make humane and healthy choices. Our Fund a Farmer project, of which this webinar series is um, part of, awards grants and uh, facilitates peer-to-peer -peer farmer education to increase the number of animals that are raised humanely in our country. So your pres uh, presenters this afternoon, first we have uh, Homer Walden of Sunnyside Farm, which is located in Southern Pennsylvania. Um, I should also say that all our presenters uh, are past and present uh, uh, grantees of the Fund of Farmer Grants recipients. Um, Sunnyside Farm is located in Southern Pennsylvania in 2013. In fact, awarded Homer and his wife Drew a Fund of Farmer Grant to build a dozen mobile pens for their broiler chickens on pasture. So added to the mobile pens they already had, they now raise several thousand birds annually. Today, Homer will be sharing how he designed and constructed and now uses these pens for their flocks. Our second presenter is Christine Deck of Deck Family Farm in Western Oregon. Uh, in 2012, FACT awarded the Decks a farm, Fund a Farmer grant to build portable pasture uh, housing for 3,500 broiler chickens. And today, Christine will be sharing her farm's experience with raising poultry on pasture. Our final presenter this afternoon is Terrell Spence, Spencer of Across the Creek Farm in Northwestern Arkansas. Just uh, in 2000. 14, Spencer, or Spence and his wife, Carla, received a Fund a Farmer grant to increase the safety and uh, living conditions of their pasture laying hens. Specifically, their grant funds were used to build a steel hoop house style chicken coop. And he'll be uh, sharing his experience with this structure and some other methods of rotating his birds on pasture. So we are thrilled to have all three of them with us today and thank them for sharing their knowledge and their expertise. Homer, Christine, and Spence will all be available later on to answer your questions um, at the end of the webinar. If you could save those questions for later, that'd be great just so that we they don't get um, lost throughout the presentation. And now, without further ado, I'm going to ask Homer to please take it away. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me uh, on board here. This is really awesome. Uh, my first webinar thing. So anyway, uh, a little bit about my background, I'll be quick. Uh, I used to be an experimental model maker at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. That was my previous life. Now I'm a, I raise chickens. So uh, a bit of a, a shift. Um, and uh, I have my daughter showing me how to do this thing. All right. Yeah, the techie. All right. This is my, this is my brooder. It's, a, uh, it's actually a, a water tank for uh, cows. It's a 100-gallon tank, uh, it's metal, and it's, uh, I put wood chips in it, a drinking uh, thing, and uh, I'm looking for buttons. All right, here we go. And it has a lid that closes. That I, I just set the light right on the lid uh, with a, it's clamped to a piece of wood on the right-hand side. Uh, so that it doesn't, you know, become a fire hazard because those lights will burn your barn down if, if they break. Uh, and when it gets really cold out, you know, sometimes these things will uh, happen when nobody's looking. Um, so I can put about 30 to 35 birds in this thing, and they do quite well. Uh, they don't uh, They don't seem to be too crowded until they're, about two weeks, two to three weeks old, then we put them out in the uh, mobile pens. This is my, uh, this is my uh, night shift crew. They, they take care of any uh, vermin that happens to uh, come by looking for a chicken snack. You know, a lot of times farmers have rodents and things like that running around 
just because of all the feed and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, a Jack Russell or a, um, a Dachshund, they make great, you know, masters. That's And the one, the dog on the top, that's just a big hound dog we have. She keeps the other ones warm all winter. So um, this is our, this is the basic structure for our uh, mobile uh, egg, egg mobile, I guess you call it. Um, then I use either milk crates that I purchase in New Jersey or, you know, you can use five gallon jugs if you have them. Uh, it has a, a ladder structure down the center for the roosts and it's just, you know, two by sixes and two by fours is nothing really uh, uh, too complicated. It's eight feet wide, 10 feet long. Uh, just about four feet high and it's really stable so that if you have a 50 or 60 mile an hour windstorm, it doesn't blow it all around your backyard. Um, this is the, one of our broiler pens. We also raise meat birds and, um, we use a PVC pipe just because it doesn't get, you know, it doesn't fill up with algae and stuff from sunlight. And, it, and we use, uh, hardware cloth on the end because chicken wire will rust out really quick and the tarp is from it's uh from nelly tarps they're the people that make tarps for tractor trailer trucks so they're good up to about 80 miles an hour um you know so they're, they're durable they'll last about 20 years uh the pen on the left is just a you know home depot tarp and it'll last you about two years so and our pens if you can see the wheel uh, on the right hand side, there's a wheel on both sides and a rope that you can pull and it lifts the back of the pen up a little bit so that it's easy to move. Uh, this is our meat birds. This is a bell drinker. Um, I've discontinued using those because the birds will get under them and drain the water uh, supply out. And on a hot day, everybody knows what happens when your chickens don't have water. So uh, there you have it. And these are probably 10, eight week old uh, broilers. Uh, they're ready to harvest. And, um, you know, that works out pretty good, this system. There's our eggs. We get a, we're getting about 175 eggs a day right now. That's a lot for us because we only have 200 uh, egg layers. And, um, of course, I always love the spring. We get our eggs back. Oh, and... Um, so I'm going to back up to, to that last one. We have about 15 varieties of chickens, uh, and they're not the, the heavy egg layers. They're just the, uh, they're, they're uh, not <laughs> heritage breed birds. I couldn't think of the word. And they, um, the Aracanus will lay the blue eggs, and, you know, we got some cuckoo marins that lay the, the chocolate-colored ones, and then there's a variety of, of tan colored eggs that you know that the rest of them will lay and um they just look great in the box you know people love to get in the uh, different colored varieties of eggs and they all taste the same by the way i've had that question a lot this is inside the uh the layer pen uh you can see there we use uh milk crate and um i, I purchased an old ladder for 50 cents and that's their roost I I do a lot of scouting around for stuff, random stuff. That's another one with the uh, uh, fresh bedding. Of course, with the fresh bedding, you, your eggs are a lot cleaner. Uh, we just get straw from the hardware store for five bucks a bale. And um, you can see the, there's an open bottom underneath for the birds to scratch around. The first day, they'll scratch through the grass. And then the second day, they're on the same spot. They'll actually... You can see them in there taking dirt baths and stuff because they they just like to scratch around in the soil. And on the third day, I'll move them um, to a fresh spot. And there they are. Uh, that's a fresh move there. I so said they have plenty of grass and uh, forage. The thing about, you know, everybody knows pasture-raised chicken eggs are just, you know, uh, unmatched by anything else out there. There's our, our setup there, my flotilla. Um, around those pens, um, 
I'll show you on one of the next clips. I have a, an electric wire right at the ground. It keeps out the uh, uh, foxes, skunks, raccoons, you know, whatever else might happen to be strolling around there at night looking for a snack. Uh, there's 50-gallon drums out in the field. I just fill those with water, and then I'll just pull a bucket out of there and, and fill up the uh, the tubs that are in the bottom of the pen. That's either easier for me than standing around watching a hose run. And um, there's our feed bin. Uh, we'll, it holds six tons. I only get three tons at a time uh, because you don't want to have uh, too much feed sitting around in a, in a hot uh, metal uh, tank for too long. It's good for about maybe six or eight weeks, and then it gets stale, and then the birds don't like it as much. This is uh, their supplements. They get oyster shells and grit. Uh, now you can see that little insulator wire going across about the middle of the screen with that yellow insulator. That's the that's my little uh, surprise wire for the varmints. And, of course, the dogs don't get near it either. There's our turkey pen. Inside, there's about 30 turkeys. These are about 7-pound birds. And when they hit 7 pounds, you can move them a couple of times a day, and they'll they'll just flatten out whatever you pull them over. If you can get them over a, a six foot uh, tall weed, uh, they will mow it down. And they love thistle plants. So and there they are again. You can see what they do to the ground after they've been there for a, for a little while. They, they pretty much uh, mow it down and they don't leave anything but dirt. Here's our uh, little bigger picture of the turkeys on the left. And you can see a, another pen on the right, upper right-hand corner. That's a pig pen. Uh, and I included that because the structure is, the base structure is the same as the chicken pens and with goat paneling uh, fabricated over top. There it is again. It's got its own watering system. Again, a PVC pipe with a pig nipple on one end. And uh, they get a little tarp too because they need shade. They don't have any sun protection, any uh, UV protection. I'm not going to go out there and put SPF on my pig, so they like it better that way. But you can hose them down a little bit. They like to get a, you know, a little sprinkle of water every day. And uh, I just pull the pen over the. Those are like some funky apples there on the end. Uh, that was right before I move them. And uh, you know they're they are great for eating all your leftover weeds and food or whatever you, else you might have laying around that's uh, that you that you don't want to eat or uh, give to the other animals. Here's the bed after it's finished. Uh, my wife just started a a flower growing operation, and uh, that's just ground cover over the seeds that we put down in the fall. And you can see those pigs do a pretty thorough job of. Uh, clearing away the sod, the grass, and everything else. So it's a, another part of our operation that really works well. And I don't have to sit on a tractor all day, so that's pretty nice too. There's what, This is what we have for our we, – we show people about ground truthing. Uh, this is our farm. Uh, you can see where all the pens have been and all the movement. So if somebody wants to check you out and see if you're doing a pasture raise operation, this is an easy way for them to uh, – check you out you know i mean it's a uh it's a google maps and um you can go on to the uh, satellite imagery and you get a full detail of what's going on in the ground on the ground that's a you know that's awesome stuff this was last year's uh picture i think they update that every couple of years so yeah so if i you know somebody wants to you know look into your farm there's how you do it we have a, if you want to, I don't know where, well, most of you are not really local, but we, we are doing a uh, uh, a pen building workshop on April the 16th. That's the uh, contact information for that. And uh, that's pretty much uh, it for, for me. I don't have any more pictures, and I just wanted to keep it under the time frame I had available, so. No, that's perfect. That's perfect, Homer. Yeah, sure. And I'm sure we'll have um, 
plenty of questions later uh, after the presentations are, are done. I appreciate all the pictures and um, sure. uh, especially the, the Google map was that's an, that is an interesting way to kind of check things out. Um, our next presenter is Christine Deck of Deck Family Farm. I'm just going to progress this slide for you, Christine, and then um, allow you to take it away. Um, hi, this is Christine Deck. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, I can't hear any feedback. <laughs> this is also the first time for me. Um, Sounds so, good, Christine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're out here in um, Western Oregon, and I'm going to just tell you about um, our pasture raised poultry program. We raise um, certified organic layers on pasture um, between two and three thousand. Um, we raise up to three thousand roasters, or what people often call broilers, and then about three hundred heritage turkeys, and we've also started doing some broad-breasted white chippy and all those on pasture. So I'm just going to take you on a tour of our program and progress to the next slide. So who is Deck Family Farm? It um, began with a picture on the left, my husband and me and our five children um, back in 2003. <laughs> and um, you know, is ideal having a, a large family. Everybody participated and things worked well. Um, but then the kids grew up and um, we wanted to continue farming. And so the picture on the right is just kind of a snapshot of one of our farm crews. And um, we now uh, employ about 10 employees, do an intern program, five to seven interns. And um, uh, yeah, and uh, maybe three to five more seasonal employees. So um, we like the farming. We wanted to continue. Um, and that's who Deck Family Farm is. So some of the kids still um, and a bunch of other people that we call family that all participate. So that's who Deck Family Farm is. Um, so why choose to raise pastured poultry? Um, I think um, most folks might agree that this is disgusting. This is a picture of what's called a free range layer operation. Um, it reminds me of some of the farms where I grew up in the San Joaquin Valley of California where foster farms dominate the chicken raising scene. And um, my friends and family, my friend and their family uh, grew up raising chickens for foster farms. And it wasn't a very fun life for a farmer. Their Their work basically consisted of walking through the, the houses that they would house those chickens in for two weeks at a time and picking up dead ones and sterilizing everything for the next batch, next batch to come in. So that was my that was my introduction into poultry when I was younger and, and I thought it was fairly disgusting and um, never even imagined that there was another way to do it. I mean, I grew up in a multi-generational farming family so I mean everyone I knew had some sort of small poultry operation in a backyard, but not not to scale. So I didn't realize that you actually could scale poultry until much later. And um, thankfully, there's lots of people doing it and lots of good ideas in contrast to this. So this is a picture of two of our trailers on pasture. We have um, four trailers, and these are our layers. Um, and they're probably, this is, looks like a May pasture. Um, we raise a variety of breeds, um, Aracana, Rhode Island Red, we also do Morans, some Menorcas, which advise against Menorcas, um, Australorps, Delaware's Red Stars, so we do a variety of hens. Um, we were AWA um, for a while, and they only wanted um, low, like you couldn't have hens that would raise, that would lay too many eggs, um, so we definitely stayed in that heritage program. Today we're no longer AWA. We do have some um, higher egg laying, higher egg rate laying, hens that lay more eggs per year. Um, we uh, want to be sustainable not only in, in, um, in environmental practice and be humanitarian, but we also want to be sustainable financially. So we found that um, it was important for us to try to keep our lay rates a little bit higher than 
40, 50%, which is what we're getting with our heritage verge around. Um, so the pros and cons, what our experience has been with our pasture-raised layers. Um, it's awesome um, not having them up in coops, laying them, having them out in the pasture um, keeps the hens and the eggs um, clean. We move them to fresh ground twice a week using a tractor. Um, we do have reduced seed, seasonal reduced seed costs um, we, uh, because a certain amount of what they're eating is, is coming from forage. Um, in spring, it's greater, and the winter is far less. We do set stock in, in the winter, and it's never as much fun as in the summer and spring when they're out. Um, but there is, a, a, there is a reduced seed cost there. Um, parasite control, we have a multi-species farm. We raise beef, lamb, pork, um, and sheep. So we pull the trailers after those animals on pasture. So um, it would be nice to have a picture of this, but if you pull those chickens across after the beef, instead of a nice dark cow pie, you'll just see it all decimated and spread out all over. So they're picking out those parasites um, from the beef so that the next group that comes on there it's a little cleaner. They're also um, adding more nitrogen to the soil, more phosphorus in the soil. Um, our soils have been greatly improved where the chickens have been grazing um, in terms of not only organic matter, but phosphorus. Um, and they're enjoyable to work with. It's just, it's nice um, going out to hens on pasture. There's not much smell. Um, they're on green grass. It's very bucolic. The hens are happy. They're healthy. It's enjoyable. And um, the cons that we've experienced is there's definitely a challenge in predation. You can kind of see in this picture there's an electronet kind of back toward that, um, that water tower back there, that black water tower. And so we will use electronet, but we move them so much, such a great distance, that setting up electronet every time we move them isn't really practical. The electronet in this picture is actually used just to keep cows on one side and the chickens on the other. Um, but we really, even if we did use Electronet, which we'd need a lot of, um, it's not practical to continue moving it. So we do have some loss due to eagles, um, hawks, skunks, coyote, um, raccoon, those kind of things. And for a while we had a guardian dog, um, but that kind of had some other issues involved with it. So the guardian dog is no longer with the chicken. So we do have some loss due to predation, and we really haven't, other than locking them up at night, which actually does help quite a bit, um, haven't come up with a, a, bulletproof, uh, a bulletproof solution there. Uh, the second con that I would see is the winter season set stock. Um, winter, you know, we have a lot of rain here in the winter, um, and we can't be grazing them on the lowlands. They'd just be in a mud pit. We can't get out there with the tractors and the trailers. So the cons, it, one of the cons is having to bring them up on the hillside and set stocking them in the winter because then you kind of go back to this situation where you just have a lot of chickens on a small amount of ground and it's fairly poopy and there's definitely a smell. Um, there isn't even an, an advantage within that con is that we do have the opportunity to collect their manure and compost it um, at the end of that period of time. And that's usually from November to March, weather depending. So we do we are able to collect that manure at that time and, and they're not too crowded. I mean we still we use a large greenhouse and they have plenty of room to wander and roam, but not like in the spring, summer and fall. Uh the third con that I would say is the need to move frequently. So you've got to get out there with a tractor um and, and move these big houses. So it takes a couple people, about two man hours, I guess, a day, um, the days that you move them. So we just move them twice a week. That keeps the pasture fairly unscarred and um, but there's you know that that man time that those man hours to do that um another speak up a little bit okay i'm being told to talk more loudly um so another con is you know if they're if they're set there too long if they will damage the pasture and um, we put a lot of effort into pasture management trying to keep our pastures um fertile growing a nice mat unless we're renovating and um, so, you know, you really got to keep them moving or they're, they are going to damage the pasture. Those, those dirt baths are something that we um, understand the chickens need but try to avoid a little bit. Um, although, of course, they're going to find those spots and do it anyway. And then another con of raising the 
layers on pasture, I would say, is the seasonality of production. And um, I have a, a slide coming up here where we'll more fast. Speed it up. Okay. <laughs> I'll speed it up. Um, the seasonality of production. So we do have a dip in production in the winter. Um, we Our production ranges from about 30% mid-winter when it's cold and wet to about 85% in, um, in the spring. So, you know, if they were inside, we've been told that that, that lay rate would stay a lot more constant than it is, but we definitely experience a dip. Okay. So, um, and that, so here's one of the pros of raising animals on pasture or any, any animals, but especially chickens, is that, you know, it began as a very family-friendly endeavor. Everyone could um, be involved. You know, you didn't have to be, you didn't have to be an adult to collect eggs or to wash eggs or to water the chickens. I mean, it was a really nice um, family-friendly, and the kids wanted to be there. Um, they, you know, they want to be involved because it was accessible and they felt like they had, you know, power and autonomy. The little girl on the right now is 17, but um, she basically was our, our egg laying manager there back in 2008. She was our hen manager and she did a great job and it was um, really rewarding. Um, so here's a picture of us constructing one of our layer trailers. You saw the layer trailer in a previous, the few previous, the slides previous to this, I think number two and number four. So um, basically, they're um, reclaimed mobile home chassis. Um, the total cost to build, including the chassis, the lumber, the labor hours, it, um, priced at $12 an hour. All the hardware is about four to $5,000 a trailer. Uh, it takes about 80 people hours or 80 man hours to build them. And you know we predict the life to be 17 years. We don't have one that's older than that right now, but we have had to do some small renovations. But that's about, um, yeah, so that's what it looks like, constructing one of those. Um, here's a picture of taking the pullets out of their brooder pen and introducing them to the trailer. So we do put the hens in the trailer and then we lock them up for about a week so that they home to that trailer and they know that that's where they live. Um, and then we open the doors and after that, they really tend to know where they live even though we raise them in batches you know, every 18 to 24 months for culling. We tend to see the same hens go back to the same trailer over their entire laying life. And that's just a picture of uh, one of our daughters and an intern unloading them in there. Um, this is what it looks like when we move them down to spring pasture. So right here our farm manager is bringing the trailer down from the set stock, which is up at the top of the hill. And he's just pulling it down into the spring pasture. And you can see not ideal that we're kind of scarring up the pasture there. But, you know, it's, it's a real dance here between wanting to get those hens out and waiting for the pastures to dry. It's just something that um, we play with every year trying to keep, um, you know, optimize our advantages here. And what he has there is that trailer in the back, and then in the front, we have a big wooden box that we keep our layer feed in, um, and we just feed that out into PVC feeders, which I'll show you in a few more slides. And then on top of that, he's got a roll of Electronet, and these are probably hens that, haven't been let out yet, so he's just going to electronet them in for a few days just to get them to home. Um, so here's a here's a just a little a visual uh, chart of one of the disadvantages that we see about raising animals on pasture and how seasonal seasonal temperature change really affects negatively um, what we do. Um, so on the y-axis, you see there's cases per week. So um, you know, with 3,500 hens, you can see we could produce 120 cases a week. And for people who don't do, deal in cases, um, a case is 15 dozen eggs. Um, that would be in flats and cartons either. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of the volume. And down that blue line is demand. And you can see that our supply and our demand are opposite. So the demand is highest when um, the weather's cold. People are inside baking, there's Thanksgiving, there's Christmas, um, a lot of demand for egg, and you know we're, we're just often short of what people want. Whereas in the spring and the summer, um, hens really pick up, the lay rate's really good, and we just find that the demand is just not there like it is in the middle of the winter. So I think that in a pasture program, you're gonna just deal with those seasonal variations of lay. And, um, and the supply and demand, it's not ideal, but it's um, 
is something that we work with, and we've been um, playing with some solutions to that. Um, we put light in our um, greenhouse that they're set stocked in in the winter. We pull the trailers up right next to the greenhouse, so they're still going back to their trailers, but then they have a warm, dry place to hang out during the day. That has seemed to help just keeping their temperature up. Um, and um, feeding them a little bit higher protein in the winter has helped. We mill our own feed um, at about a savings of $300 a ton. But in the winter, we'll go back to a pre-milled uh, grain that we buy from the local mill that maybe gives them more nutrition, maybe just kind of helps them get through that, that low lay lump. And then in the spring, we'll go right back to our milled food, which reduces our cost, and we expect them to get a little bit more nutrition from the forage. So we try to even out the curve as much as we can. Um, so today's program, um, you know, we have a flock size between two and 3,000. And we cull between 24 and 36 months, so that means that we get about 18 months of lay, 18 to 24 months of lay. Um, and of, the, of this layer program, we also pull some heritage roasters because even though we buy sex birds trying to buy all hens, there's always some males that come through. So because we're certified organic for all of our pastures, those and we feed certified organic grain, all of those those roosters that we pull that we got in the hen flock we can sell is our certified organic heritage roasters. And they don't taste too bad. Um, six months is much older than you'd normally raise a heritage roaster, but they actually have great flavor. They're not tough. They're not like a stewing hen, and people really like them. And that's worked better for us than raising, um, raising heritage broilers organic because it's hard to recover the price point. But here we feel like, well, we raised them for six months before we realized they're roosters. So we're able to recoup some of that cost of raising them. Um, I should mention here, I don't have the data up, but that our chickens are a good percentage of our income on the farm. Um, they, um, they're they definitely one of our top money makers. Um, people love, love organic pasture-raised hens. I think the previous, um, the previous presenters said that people just go crazy over them. They love the colors. They swear the taste is different, whether it is or not, I would I don't know, but they swear the taste is 100% different and people ask us for eggs at the market and if we're out, they'll almost go into a panic that they, they, they can't get their eggs and we retail our eggs at $8 a dozen, we wholesale at six. We have absolutely no problem getting rid of them at any time of the year um, and, you know, our production is pretty high, so I see, the, I see the future is good and I think there's lots of opportunity there for other pasture growers. Um, and this is just a picture of a farm tour, so people just like it. You know, it's novel for them. They're seeing all kinds of negative stuff on the media. And I think they really appreciate going out to a kind of what they call a real farm. Okay, so that kind of ends the, the tour of the pasture-raised um, layers. And now we'll talk about broilers. So um, we began raising broilers in kind of makeshift tents, of which you'll see in, in the next slide. Um, we also built the Salatin style 10 by 10. Um, Joel Salatin, who we we learned about after coming here because every other customer said, Have you heard of Joel Salatin? Have you heard of Joel Salatin? And I was like, Who's Joel Salatin? And so that was kind of cool to see that somebody's already out there doing very similar things to what we were doing. So um, we kind of borrowed some ideas, and he had these 10 by 10 tractors at the time that we modeled our, our broiler operation out off after. And this is just a picture of three of them out in the pasture. The two on the left are the Cornish rock saw, and the one on the right are the Heritage Roasters. I think at the time we're experimenting with um, a Delaware Rhode Island Red Heritage Roaster raising on pasture similar to the Cornish. And if you want to find out more about that experiment, you can go to our blog and we have a little uh, report there on how that went. And just to be a, you know, to let you know, it went okay. Um, it was hard to move them at the market at a dollar more a pound. Folks were a little reticent. But this was also, you know, quite a while ago. I think the market for organic has really increased. So that's a picture of the 10, 10 by 10. And you can see we just have the automatic waters in there. We have since moved to the bell waters, which seemed to work out okay for us. But, uh, you know, a lot of work to take those waters out, take the feed out. Every time you move them, pull back the chart, put it back in. Um, quite a bit of effort there. Um, so this is just a picture of one of our brooders. We've built many brooders over the year. Um, and RJ, my son-in-law, who actually was a SAC grant recipient, and he built those two houses, this is his 
he, this was one of his brooders, where he basically built a room out of straw, and the door there is just where you walked in. And I'll show you a picture of what the inside looks like here. But there's RJ just in the brooder working with Chick, getting him to drink, um, which we do when they come in. And then you just see the wall behind him is made out of hay bales. So it was really warm. We had some heaters in there. It all went well. But it wasn't predator-proof. Primarily cats on the farm would get in there and uh, eat our babies. And there's one of our cats. <laughs> so skunks and owls and hawks and raccoons are all an issue. But honestly, the farm cat tended to be the worst. And this is um, not the same brooder that I showed you in the previous picture, but another permutation. So we had eight brooders here. And you can see Torsi. Um, walking on top of one of them, trying to get in. Torsi is the name of our cat. Um, trying to get into those chickens, those chicks. And this was actually taken from a wildlife camp because we couldn't figure out who these chickens and then we figured out who it was. Um, this brooder style worked great. We probably had about six different brooder permutations and this is one of them. And it was okay, but this particular barn burnt down, not from, uh, not from brooder lights, by the way, which is a common problem, but it was a hay fire, but we no longer have that barn. To build the same style brooder. <laughs> um, this is an early model of an open house. So when we first started raising birds, we we did, you know, have a very rudimentary um, uh, tent style um, uh, trailer that we pulled around on the on the pasture. This was like 50 bucks. You know, the tarp was 20, the PVC was 30. Um, super cheap. You just moved it inside of Electronet. Um, the wind would pick it up. It was very light. Uh, it wouldn't last. You know, it lasts a season and you throw it away, so not ideal. Um, it was cheap to build, but it was flimsy and it blew away and it got windy, which it does here in the spring. And this is just another picture of the Salatin style 10 by 10. Um, you know, in contrast um, to the hoop houses, they're, they're cheap to build, they, they do better manure distribution, but the cons to me, well, and this is a little bit of a divided issue in, in our home that sometimes divides down gender lines. Um, some folks really like it for the manure, manure distribution. You know, everybody's in there. Everybody's kind of in the same spot, leaving manure across the field. Um, I kind of prefer, um, oh, oh, sorry. I was going to go on to the hoop style, but this is a picture of my son just moving the hens in the 10, or sorry, the layer, ah, the broilers in the 10 by 10. So you can see he's had to take out the water, take out the feeder, move them, then he'll put them all back in. So, um, yeah, very controlled, very um, very even manure distribution, a lot of work. Take some finesse to move those 10 by 10s because in the back, the chickens will get caught. So actually, in the beginning, you have to train them by having somebody walk behind them and kind of scare them off that back end. But after you do that for a few days, they're actually trained pretty quick. But here is the new model of our chicken houses. Um, and again, these are heritage roasters you're seeing here. And this is a picture of RJ, my son-in-law. He was the Fund, Fund of Farmer Facts Grant recipient. And he built several of these hoop-style structures, um, also for raising broilers on the field. And the advantage to these is that they can move about. They're not confined. Um, they go in and out during the day. Obviously, there's more predation with this style as well. Um, but they're relatively inexpensive. Um, they didn't blow away. They were heavy enough that they, they didn't blow. And again, yeah, you know, they're not the confinement style, which to me is um, sometimes less appealing. And here's another picture of them. Um, this, the pros and cons of Quonset style is that, um, you know, pros, birds are free to move. There's better ventilation, airflow, and temperature control. It does get hot here in the summer. Um, the birds are engaging in more natural behaviors of foraging and pecking and moving about. You don't have to move them as often. You can move them every other day or every third day, just whenever that area gets sparred up. Um, Cons, more predation. Um, the manure does get concentrated more inside the house than out, so it's not that nice even distribution. It's a little bit more scattered. Um, and they're a lot harder to catch at harvest time. So when it comes time to um, pulling, they don't all be, they're not all in there at night. It's not like you can just go in there and grab them all. They're kind of everywhere. So you have to go out and set up an electron net and kind of chase them about. So I'd say that's kind of a con. They're a little stressed out. Whereas in the 10 by 10, you just open them up and grab them. This is a picture of our feeders right here. You see the, on the left the PVC feeders. That's what we use for any roasters or layers on the field. The feed just goes in the top and they pack it right out of this. And on the right, I just have a picture of the hens staying cool in the shade in the summer in those hoop style houses that RJ built. 
Um, which is better, you know, I don't know. I mean, to me, it kind of is humanitarian ideas versus, um, you know, precise uh, uh, forage management. Um, you know, it's kind of up for people to decide which, which works better for their program. I think there's pros and cons of both. I'm not sure which is better. We do both right now. Um, that's how we resolve that problem. Um, so we also do a few, um, that's the it for the boiler program. Um, here we are looking at some of our pasture raised turkeys. We raise them and also mobile um, houses here. This is just a mobile home chassis, which you don't see with some, which you can't see in the picture, but that's what it is. And then there's some logs strung across the bottom for the turkeys to roost, and then just pig panels or cattle panels across the top of the tarp. Um, and then you can see we did electron at the men. The problem with the pastured um, turkey operation is if we didn't clip their wings before they started to learn to fly, they flew away. And there was one year, and this, this is a picture of some of the, just the, the native broad turkeys in our neighborhood. So one year we had about mm, 150 um, heritage turkeys, and of those about 50 ran away with a neighborhood flock. And they would come around every day and get our turkeys all riled up. Our turkeys were already flying, and we hadn't clipped their wings. And pretty soon they just kind of all started leaving. And then now when I drive around the neighborhood, I see uh, lots of Narragansett and White Holland and Blue Slate and uh, beautiful birds that escaped us several years ago. So that was a little bit of a money money losing year. Um, solution to that, the next year we tried netting. What you see those buckets on top of poles are just to hold up the poultry netting um, to try to keep them from flying away. It was, really didn't work very well. Um, you know, as you can see how difficult that pin would be to move very often. Um, and then, of course, we get holes in the netting, birds get caught. Not the greatest solution. Um, what we found now, the best solution is just to clip their wings before they start flying. So really, right as they leave the brooder, we clip the flight wings on one side. And that resolved that problem. Also, raising a few more heavy breeds has helped having the white turkeys in there and a few broad-breasted bronze. They just seem to want to, if there's a bigger group that lives at home, they seem to want to stay at home. And this is it. That concludes my presentation. Um, this is just a picture of a farmer's market booth. You see eggs there on the table and chickens in the little ice table there. Um, it's been a great addition to our overall program, having pasture-raised poultry. Um, the taste is there. Um, the, the visual is there for people that they can relate to that idea of raising birds out in the open. Um, you do have to charge more. It's not as um, scalable as a confinement situation. But um, but anyway, yeah, we find that eggs at least are like a, what is it called, a, um, a gateway drug to our meat. So it's awesome. Um, people come eating eggs and then they explore other products. And it's been a great addition to our farm. And that, I think, is good for me. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Christine. Is that the same um, daughter that we saw earlier? Oh, <laughs> that is not one of my daughters, but I would like it if she were. That was one of my Oh, <laughs> And another intern there across the way, they're having a conversation there. Awesome. Yeah. You have to stage those type of things. Well, thank you so yeah. much. That was a wonderful presentation, especially the, the compare contrast. I think that's very helpful for folks trying to decide the, the best way to go. And you know, I'm imagining you'll probably get some um, pointed questions um, during the Q&A. Um, but our final speaker I'd like to introduce is Spence of Across the Creek Farm, and I'm going to just progress this slide and allow him to start his presentation. Take it away, Spence. Um, yeah, my name is Spence, uh, Across the Creek Farm. We're in northwest Arkansas. Uh, we did about 12,000 broilers on pasture. Um, I think we'll hold steady this year at that and probably increase next year. Um, because we've had some new markets open up. Uh, I'm also the president of APA, the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association. Uh, I don't know if everyone's familiar with that, but it's an awesome organization. We put out a bi-monthly newsletter. We've got like most of the experts in the field. Um, and uh, there's a, a nice forum where you can ask questions. Uh, anyway, so if it's something you'd be willing to, to uh, hear more about, just let me know. Um, so this, this picture right here, this slide is on one, our broiler grow out pasture. Uh, you can see we've got these broiler pins, they're 10 by 12, um, and we just march them down in rows 
just kind of I think the other two presenters have have hit most of the the highlights so I'll just kind of fill in uh they're 10 by 12 uh we don't day range we we raise them they stay in the pens and we move the pens daily and maybe twice a day towards the end um, just depending on pasture and lots of other things uh we daisy chain them together uh so they all the for watering all the water waters are connected we have a, a center a center line uh up at the top of the the pasture we have a, a water spigot attached to city water We've got a three-quarter inch line, like black poly tube line, that runs the entire thousand foot of the pasture. And then every hundred foot, we have quick connects. Um, Plasson makes a a real nice quick connect that you there's a male and a female end, and you can just take a hose and just push it in um, and uh, and go at, at the front of the first pin. There'll be a pressure reducer, uh, a maxi flow pressure reducer, and then we have bell waters throughout. And we'll cover that a little more. So this is one of our brooders. Uh, we've actually went to gas. We run propane now. Um, at the time this picture was taken, I think propane was like $4 a gallon. Uh, now it's $0.99. Cents. Um, and it's a much better heat than a heat lamp. Uh, you can get brooder jets. They look, they're these big space alien kind of looking uh, heaters. Um, they ha You can find old ones for really inexpensive, but to conserve the fuel, you really need to go with one of the new, um, I think space rays, what they're called, like ray gun and uh, uh, brooder jets. And they they have a pilot that runs continuously. If something happens, it'll shut off. So they're pretty safe. Uh, and then it'll, it'll light up and it just focuses all that propane heat straight down. And if our house has, we, we converted it from propane to gas heat or propane to electric heat. And if you've had gas heat in your home, you know that the difference between gas and electric. So you tend to have less piling, and the it, the advantage to the the gas would be that it actually dries out your bedding as well, so you don't have as many problems with ammonia. But we'll take them um, anywhere from two to four weeks, depending on. Uh, my first batch right now is three weeks a day um, uh, for the season, and we'll get them out um, here next week because the weather turned old tonight. Uh, this is just kind of, uh, this is not our operation. I was an organic livestock inspector, went through the trainings for that. And this was a certified organic pasture raised poultry house up in the Northeast that I got to inspect. Um, anyways, that's kind of what we're up against uh, in a good way, because it's a lot easier to produce a product better than that. So these are our pins. Um, on the back, you can see the PVC lines. Um, that's where the waters go. Uh, you can see the red coal, uh, K-U-H-L, make a good 50-pound feeder. If it's adjusted right, you don't get much feed spillage. Uh, this is in spring. You can see in the, the foreground, there's some straw patches or, or, or uh, an area like that. We actually had a snow, um, an, a late snow. It was the latest snow on record. Uh, th that year, which I think was last year, and uh, one of the things you can do, and in, in when it's especially when the birds are small, there's a lot of rain. So if your ground's really wet and it's cold and wet, are are killers for especially younger birds. The big ones can get through it. So you can put down straw. Um, straw works best. Hay is kind of second, but straw works really well. Hay will work too. But you put it down, um, and that gets them off that cold, wet ground. Uh, you know, I was in the military. Um, I got into farming after the war, and I don't know if you ever slept on wet ground that's mud or wet ground that's straw or grass. There's a huge difference. So one of them you can stay relatively warm, especially huddling together. The other one you can't. So this is a picture of a dolly. Uh, this is actually a, a friend's a picture from a friend that I used to make my dolly. That's just, you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy like standard, I think it's half inch gas pipe. Um, and uh, you can get all the, the things you need at, at Lowe's to build one of these or tractor supply. Um, the reason we use the dolly is we pop it under the back and raise it up. And that keeps us from getting caught on any clumps of grass or anything like that. It also keeps us from, if we do run over a bird or we pull the pin and you get a, a bird that's distracted, they'll squawk usually and you can back the pin up or they'll they'll hop out 
Um, actually, I think that's one of our pins. I think that's my dolly. So, uh, anyways, uh, you know, and the other advantage to it is that uh, it just it, your pins stay a lot longer. If you look in the bottom corners, you'll see some one by fours that kind of that are supports, and those are really critical. And they're also on that top two by four as well. And they're really critical to keep your your pin stable. Like when you pull on the pin and it encounters resistance in the back with the dolly as it's going through the grass and that, um, your pin will tend to like kind of scissor, like where it goes one side or the other. If you put those one by fours in, they really help with keeping your pin solid and lasting a long time. And also any place you can put screws when you build your faster pins, you want to use screws instead of nails because nails will eventually work themselves for uh, loose. Screws will stay on firm. So we run two different types of broiler housing. You guys have seen the one, the, um, our little pasture pens that are 10 by 12, and they'll have anywhere from 65, uh, 60 to 70 birds, uh, depending on the season and how packed we are. You know, it just depends on a lot of things. Um, we Last year, uh we when we used uh, part of our our grant for this we were really looking into predation losses from on our laying flocks but we also wanted to try it with our broilers so we we actually went with uh they're a 40 by 20 steel hoop house structure um and so we moved with the tractor daily you can see it on the right and we put uh 450 to 500 broilers for let's say 400, 500 ish, yeah, and uh, it gets moved daily, and so we can. That's about five to six hundred, about is about a full flock size on a run, uh, and so uh, and sometimes we'll go all the way up to a thousand, but we're kind of still in back on the transition, and they work great uh, uh, for that, um, and we can just. About it and do it well. And the best thing about them, well, there's a lot of advantages. I think I've got it on the next slide. So this is on the end. These broilers are about ready to go. You can see the water in the left corner, run the off automatic water, just like regular, um, regular uh, pins that we were using. We also, you can see a cold finger uh, hanging up. We hang up and we move them. Uh, in the morning, so we'll feed, feed up the feeders and let the birds eat them down. You always never want to have leftovers in the morning. Um, you want them to like eat. It's kind of like like a carburetor where you got to fiddle with it because you want them to be finished up uh, the, the last um, the last little bit of uh, feed, the fines, because that's where a lot of the the nutrients and minerals are and that kind of stuff. Um, I just saw that the sound is terrible, so I apologize for that. Uh, so as you go through that, um, we raise those up and we move them forward, and it works out great for us. Uh, and the birds will follow. You know, they get trained. You put them out at three weeks. In the front, on the front and the back, you'll see we've got a, a two by eight, um, and uh, you move it forward, and that two by eight will actually. Uh, it slides back, um, it's on chains. And so that way, if a bird, when you're moving forward, it doesn't catch the grass. And when you're in the back, uh, if there's birds, if they, they tend to clump up towards the back, especially if you don't have someone shooing them and they'll pop out the back instead of getting uh, injured. And this is uh, just quickly a layer, or everyone else covered it. It's on old uh, hay, hay running gear. Um, we put about 250 birds in there. It's not very large compared to some of the other ones. Um, and it gets moved daily uh, to every day, depending on the weather and season and grass growth and all that. So we run, you can see in the back, we run our feed bin, uh, our feed bins in there, and they are. Uh, we get 15 tons of feed at a time about every three weeks during growing season. Um, and we actually have a third one now for hogs. Something I encourage you all to do is when you do get to scale, an opportunity that comes is if you can buy feed in bulk, um, like we do, we buy through Highland um, Naturals. 
they give a discount if you're a veteran. Uh, we we buy from them and they ship out. Uh, they bring in a full a full truck. Sometimes we'll uh, do 24 tons, and we're able to get quite a bit of savings off that. So I put an 11% margin and um, and I sell it to other farmers, like the the guys just getting started on hogs or broilers or layers that that don't match our scale. And they're still able, it's still 25% cheaper than what they can get it through buying it by the sack. And so they bring their own barrels and pump. And that's a significant income for us. Uh, we don't make a lot of margin, but the big thing is it helps us turn our feed over faster. Um, you know, the, the rule of thumb is you want to get use your feed, especially during hot weather, within three weeks. And you definitely don't want it to be over a month old because uh, you start losing a lot of the uh, vitamins and nutrients and that kind of stuff. The good thing is the the vitamins, like the water soluble vitamins and the fat uh, fat soluble vitamins, those are the first thing to go. But those are also found in abundance in pasture, so you do have a little bit of buffer there if your feed starts to go bad. So um, that's kind of the the down and dirty. Uh, I know I'm kind of at the tail here, so I won't go into tons of detail. If you have uh, any any questions uh let's hear them <laughs> yeah thank you spence that was great I, especially the um feed tips that you had at the end i think that's pretty helpful to folks um just so you all know we have a good chunk of time for questions and answers i'd like to thank all three of the presenters for sharing everything this afternoon um at this point, those of you that have questions, you can start typing them into the sidebar on the left. I know there were a couple from before that I'm gonna go back and find, um, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. If we don't get to all of them, we will, uh, I'll be, we'll be able to have the presenters respond to you offline too. Um, so first question I have is from Gregory um, in Colorado, and he, was wondering, and this is, I think, directed to Sunnyside, to Homer, um, he would like to see a close-up of the wheel lifting design um, from your tractor. This might be something that you could um, provide later, because I don't know that you have that in your presentation, but maybe you could describe it briefly. Yeah. Uh, hey, this is Homer. Hi, Homer. Yo. Yep. Yeah. Um, I can go probably offline and maybe send a detailed photograph of that wheel uh, apparatus that I use. It's, it's nice. It, it makes moving pens a breeze. I had my 10 year old helping me out when uh, uh, we were first starting out. And uh, yeah, yeah, I started out with the uh, salads and pens and I, I couldn't get them to move right. So I designed my own wheel system uh, to be right on the pen. And it's just, you know, it's the same thing. It's gas pipe, T-fittings, and uh, bolts and stuff. So there's, everything's off the shelf and, you know, some rope for pulling the uh, uh, the end of it. So it works like a fulcrum and lifts the pin up off the ground just enough to move it. So I'm not so we'll sure get how the, to get that picture yeah. to you. But. We'll get it. Yeah, that's the... Um contact information. I think that, Greg, if you note that in um, the survey at the very end, we will follow up with you. Um, and I think I have your email otherwise as well. I have another question from Christelle. I believe this is also for you, Homer. How many birds fit into your 8 by 10 pens? We put four up to 40 birds. Uh, that gives them about two feet, two square feet per bird when they're full sized, And, uh, you know, moving them each day uh, especially the egg layers really helps keep, you know, keep the manure uh, pressure down. And also for the, uh, the broilers as well, we just, we start moving them more often when they get bigger. Excellent. Okay. I have a question for Spence um, from Abby. What type of tarps do you use? Uh, yeah, we use used billboard tarps. You can find them. Um websites online there's you can, there's ebay stores that sell them uh they're they're pretty thick i think they're like 13 mil however they measure them um they're waterproof and i've got some that are going on their fourth year probably need to change them out because they're starting to get a little ragged uh we don't put grommets or anything in them we just use uh 
just kind of hit boards uh, on our the sides of our pins where we screw them in, and uh, and that so that works out really well for us. And on the big hoop coops, they tend to take a bigger beating. Um, we've noticed. I, I'm not exactly sure why, but we had some. We get pretty bad weather here. We had a tornado warning last night. Um, you know, and we've got tennis ball size hail, I think, before, or maybe a golf ball size definitely isn't unusual. And the tarps can really take a, a beating. Uh, so one of the things we're we're going to start doing on that is we can extend it. You can get just um, the sh shade cloth or something from the like any hoop house, farm tech, or whoever else. That's a lot cheaper than the used billboard tarps. And uh, so we're going to cover that on top of the billboard tarps to kind of extend it, um, you know, where there's holes or anything else to keep it from tearing more and add a couple more years onto the life. Excellent. Um, question from Shannon, and I'm not sure if this would be directed to someone in particular or um, maybe one of you just wants to take this, but how many square feet per bird in the mobile layer house, especially when cooped up in the winter? Um, anyone? I'll, I'll jump on that first, yeah. and then maybe uh, Ms. Beck can do it a second. Um, the, so in the, the egg mobiles that we have, there's not a lot of square footage uh, per bird. I mean, really, the only time they spend in there is when they want to drink, which it's never all at once, um, or when they're roosting at night or laying an egg. So it doesn't have to be that big. So we have a... Um, I think it's like a 16 by 8, 16 by 10 uh, egg mobile, um, and or maybe 20 by 10, and you know we can fit 300 birds in there. I mean they they pack themselves in to roost at night, um, but all the roosts are full and we don't have any problems. But as soon as you open that door, they bail out. They spend most of the day out. During winter, you need a little bit more square foot. Um, we'll have uh, we have 20 by 50 hoop houses that one of those flocks will go in and we had uh, hay and shavings and that kind of stuff in there and then compost it down. Additionally, you know, we can extend that out with electric netting in the winter if we want to give them some more space on a pretty day. Krista, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, the square footage and the low, the mobile layer trailers, um, again, is, is small. It's probably right around two foot per bird. But remember that the trailers are quite tall. Our trailers are about 20 by 60 on average. And their perches are at an angle. You saw in that one picture where the girls were perching them. So really they're only in there when they're perching at night. Their food and water is outside. And um, that's the reason for such a small footage per bird. Question from Whitney, uh, is the cost of Electronet the primary reason most of you do not use this with poultry? Um, I'll just jump in, I guess. Um, <laughs> sure. I, I, we don't use Electronet because it is expensive. It doesn't really keep out predators to any great extent, and we, and we move the bird so much, it doesn't make sense to take it down and reestablish it every time. So our use of Electronet is minimal. Yeah, that, that mirrors us. One of our biggest predators with the layers can uh, be the um, and a fence isn't going to stop them, um, and they can get real hateful when they uh, as you're trying to stop them. Uh, and then also the labor and moving them, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not as bad for me. You need to use a in our hands, and a full roll of that is, is really taxing um, on some of our employees. Um, and then it gets tangled up and frustrating. Uh, and that, you know, that really goes back to you know, our broiler. Don't use it. Uh, we're pretty big proponents. I know uh, Ms. Christine had said she saw it either way. You um, can see the pros and cons. We've really settled. We started off day ranging is kind of how that system's called. And, and we've kind of went to a pin system. Um, and for all the reasons she listed, she did a great rundown, you know manure distribution and, and that. But the biggest thing for us is management. We're able to manage flocks better. Um, and I can move, you know, we'll have 2,500 sure, somewhere in those numbers. And one person has to feed and water and move all those birds. And she's 
got to get it done by like a week, um, in the peak growing season when it's hot and you know trying to deal with netting and moving flocks of birds like that would just be a nightmare and our the type of ag we practice our soils where y'all are at y'all have good soils especially wisconsin i was drooling over those pictures um where we're at the fields that we started off on i mean they were like bare dirt like we don't have good soil in arkansas and so we now three years after we've been on like our broiler grow up property it's we're transforming it i mean it's it's beautiful it's some of the best land in the county um but uh you know we we need that management and the, the manure is one of the big big things we're after down here so that's a classic day range pinning system debate though that we probably don't need to go into here but you know we don't we don't think the bedding uh most of it is because of the labor and just we use a different management system Thank you. Spence, just so you know, your um, audio is going in and out just a bit. This is Homer. Uh, yes, on Homer. The, on the uh, electrified netting, we actually uh, we purchased a bunch of it when we first started out, and we found that we lost quite a few birds from the, uh, you know, just the other, other birds flying in and clipping them off. And uh, that's why we went to uh, fully enclosed pens, uh, moved move daily so i mean they get plenty of forage uh like that and as far as the ground predators like the ones that will dig under the pen if you just put a single electric wire around the base of the of all the pens or even a single wire somewhere near in near proximity of the pens predators will come around and you know once they get exposed to it then they're less likely to uh, continue trying to get into your pens so we don't use the, the netting anymore. Oh, thank you for, for that. Uh, next question I have is from Lily. Has anyone bred chicks in their operations? We didn't really get into that too much in this uh, webinar. But... No, we have not bred chicks. Um, I see that as a whole another operation. I do see it as valuable. It does concern me that we're, there's no negative, there's no feedback loop to the hatcheries. In terms of survival, viability, it just seems like the hatcheries pump out chicks, and you know, you don't who, you know, it seems like we might be even breeding out the survivability of chickens. Um, but anyway, I do see it as a valuable thing, but we have not engaged in it. It would be a whole other enterprise for us. This is Homer. We we had a little bit of luck breeding a a few by accident but that was about all it was we had uh, a couple of broody hens and we stuck some uh we had some duck eggs that were you know the ducks wouldn't sit on them so we stuck them under the broody hens and uh ended up with a bunch of ducks so that's about as far as our breeding experience went anything you want to add spence Yeah, if, if the audio holds up. Um, <laughs> yeah, tr traditionally, you know, poultry is something we see a lot. Uh, there, first off, if you're interested in that, there's a, a great new action, sustainable poultry network. Um, listen to what he's doing, if that kind of in your house. Uh, and there are a lot of people that are really interested in that. And, and they've got, like, just a clearinghouse of information. Also, the ALBC, the American Livestock Conservancy, they've got a lot of good information, especially on turkeys, but they also have selection and stuff, um, and I'm sure Jim Jim does a lot of work with them, uh, and he's a, he's a really nice, outstanding guy. Uh, from our perspective, um, we don't do that stuff. You know, we focus on Cornish Cross whitebirds, which do really well on pasture, um, and we use sex links, uh, red sex links and that. Um, which are kind of the, you know, both of those are industry birds, but the margins on poultry are are challenging, and we're poultry only for the while well, we do pork too, but the most of our sales come from poultry, and um, so you know, like we're really focused on those those returns and and that kind of stuff. So, uh, which for large scale farms, um, just across the pasture poultry community that tends to be the norm although it's it's not exclusive but most folks um, use those breeds thank you 
question from Mark for Christine. Um, you mentioned that you had a, once had a guard dog, a livestock guardian dog. What? Uh, but there were issues. What were they? If you want to get into that a bit. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I'll save you the long saga story, but it it boiled down to the the neighbor's dog would run back and forth along the fence line, and um, our dog job was to guard the chickens which she did very very well she was about three and a half years old when we put her down and she was never aggressive to anybody on the farm we run a preschool at the farm we've had young kids she's never aggressed to anybody on the farm but she hated that dog and she broke out and attacked the dog and um it was horrible uh, the dog lived we tied her up trying to figure out what to do she broke off again and attacked the dog again so we put her down so it's kind of a tragic ending um but yeah she just she was an Anatolian, and they go after what they don't like, um, even though she had no aggression at all in any other situation. She saw that dog as a threat, and that was the end of that. Uh, maybe I'll just add, we've been toying with the idea of just getting any old dog in the pasture because, honestly, our golden retriever will bark at eagles. So, you know, you might not need this super aggressive guardian dog, maybe just any old dog like I saw in the first presenter's video. You know, he had a hound. I mean, that might do the trick. That's really all I have to say about that. I will say that um, I'm looking into, or we're looking into um, hopefully presenting another webinar that would um, really dive into some of the live dog, uh, livestock guardian dog issues maybe in the fall. So that might come in handy for some of you. Um, question uh, for- could I, could I say something real quick oh, on that? Oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, yeah, one of the things that we've seen in the APA community that folks have been, it's kind of not a, but while it's a trend right now that people have had a lot of success with is using uh, geese uh, mixed in with layers. Um, and the trick is to use one goose. So I guess they'd just be using goose. <laughs> uh, and because uh, if you have two, they'll pair up. Um, and then if you have uh, one, I don't know if you have, anyone's ever been around a goose, like when it's threatened, but they're pretty fine, uh, regardless of, you know, wherever you've been, they're they're intimidating, and they do that to raccoons, they do it to foxes, and they do it to owls, um, and, and that kind of stuff. And hawks, if a hawk kills a bird, the goose will run out and attack the hawk, so the hawk doesn't get to eat it, and they move on. So that might be something worth looking into. Yeah, hey, uh, dogs, love them. I got six dogs running around that bag, and every one of them tasted one of my chickens before I trained it. Uh, we had to catch them in the act. You know, I threw a five-gallon empty bucket at him, and it made so much noise and rattled it scared the dog, and he never got near my chickens again. But uh, they do stay out all night prowling around the property. Uh, our our farm is fully fenced, um, so they they can stay in, and no other dogs can actually get in. But our dogs will prowl around. Uh, you know, if they hear a predator or see something, they'll go bark at it and scare it away. And that works for me. Great. Uh, next question is for, so it's for Christine and for Spence. Um, when you move your layer wagons, how far do you move them? And do you have problems with hens getting lost or not able to find the new location? Um, we don't move them far. Um, we move them just out of their area of range so they're kind of on fresh grass and for us in the spring summer and fall that would be about maybe 10 to 20 feet in front of where they were before and if you move them too far the hens will get lost um, and we've had that like you know let out lay out feeders in a line to try to get them to follow their trailers because sometimes we have little swales or um, you know there's times that we do have to move them further than they're comfortable um, you know, for instance, we were irrigating in the summer. So, um, yeah, they will get lost if you move them too far, but we try not to. Yeah, just with what Christine said, um, a couple of other points. Just move your trailer right before dark. Like if it's if you've been busy at work or, you know, work, um, come out to this morning or something to do it, don't, don't move it right at dusk because that really messes them up. Um, what she does, you know, we'll move them a little bit at a time. If we have to move them uh, a long distance, uh, we will pop them up that night and move them, night, move them in the morning and then let them out on their fresh paddock. 
Excellent. Okay. Um, question from Bob. Uh, biggest problem is owls. I can only find seven by a uh, hundred foot netting. Where can I get, where can I find affordable netting? Any insight into that? With, with owls, owls are actually the easiest avian predator um, to deal with um, because they only attack it or maybe early, early dawn um, or right at night. The easiest thing for us is just designing a system like the eggmobiles work really great. Um, they make automatic door closers now. If you can't, like for us, our one of our properties is like eight miles away. Um, and it can be inconvenient to go out there and close it every day. Um, so there, I, I would say with the owls, uh, just keep changing your management or your housing design until you get it right. Um, hawks are a little more challenging. The the goose thing, uh, this is from, I talked with uh, Mr. Saladin um, a while back, Joel Saladin, and he's having a lot of success with the geese as well. And his structures are open to where I, I feel like owls should be dive bombing them constantly but he swears by the geese. Um, so that's something we're looking at trying this year as well, um, more for hawks and coyotes, but um, anyways. Um, question, we'll take about three more questions Then any questions that we don't get to, we will direct at the, um, the offline, be able to get some answers for you folks. Uh, from Cheryl, water seemed to be my worst challenge. What types of systems do you find the most successful? So we've used the bell waters. We like those. We like the nipple water systems. We run those along the outside of our layer trailers. Um, the least, I like the least, the manual fonts that you have to unscrew the top and fill them up with a hose. We we run uh, Plasson uh, water uh, bell waters, and the, we like the breeder. They make a Plasson breeder water which uh bell water which works the best it's got the fewest amount of parts um it's like a rifle you can just clean it out slap it back together real quick uh and then you know like i said we've got an automatic watering system uh your life will change with pastured poultry once you get them on an automatic watering system um uh, i mean it's just my wife is in the background and she just went yes <laughs> so especially if you're going to do it any type of scale, if you, you plan on making it your primary enterprise, you've really got to find out a way. Um, and then there's just a lot of advantages besides labor. Um, all you're doing is dumping out the, the bowls of the bell water when you do doors for each pen and it refills. Um, you know, one of the biggest things you're going to see is your feed version and your rates. Your birds are going to grow faster than that. A bird is limited in the amount of feed it eats by the amount of water it drinks. Um, I think it's about a two to one volume, two to one, three to one volume. So it's going to drink twice as much, tw two to three times more water by volume for feed that it eats. So if that thing's running out, they're going to, um, they're not going to eat as much, which means they're not going to grow as fast. And also Mr. Homer talked about um, earlier uh, with, you know, them dying in the heat. That's something very true where we're at, you know, it gets hot down here in the South. So we've got, we can put misters in our big hoop coops. And then one of the advantages of having automatic waters is you can purge the lines of any hot water. And then you can walk behind smaller fins, we spray them down. And you successfully take in Cornish Cross at seven to eight weeks um, when during the 110, 115 degree heat waves uh, a couple years back. Uh, with, with a pretty good amount of humidity and you'll spray them down and they'll look like they're on the verge of death and then they will stand up and they'll go eat and they'll be comfortable the rest of the day. Homer, did you want to weigh in about waters? Or? Yeah, uh, the watering thing that, that um, I had to design something that worked for me and that happened to be the uh, the PVC pipe. Uh, you know, one end, one end of it, you know, it literally just lays in a rubber tub the other end of it's elevated and i can fill it with a hose and get you know like six gallons in a four inch pvc pipe and then it works just like the little miniature uh drinkers do for your brooders and that it creates a vacuum when you plug 
the end up that has the hose going into it. And then when the tub empties out, as the birds drink the water out of it, it'll just trickle back in. And you don't, and it has no mechanical parts, so that uh, the risk of failure is is very limited. Um, so unless you forget to fill it up in the morning, but I'll fill it up every day. And uh, on the scale that we operate, uh, that works best for us um, because I have to move those pens every morning. And if you know, if I'm trying to move seven gallons of water in addition to the weight of the pen, it's kind of difficult. So they'll drink most of the water during the day. In the morning, I move the pen, fill it back up again, and start all over. And that works really good for us. Okay. And I'm going to say this is our last question just because uh, it might have multiple parts. Um, does anyone have experience, this is from Sherry, um, anyone have experience in growing feed in the fields and letting chickens forage instead of providing so much feed in containers? Not me. I, I wrote a publication, ATRA, uh, A-T-T-R-A. Um, it's uh, Pasture Poultry Forages and Nutrition, um, where that talk discusses a lot of that. Uh, it, it pretty much cond condenses down to the most a bird is going to eat. Um, and we've done studies at APA, and, you know, in, in the best conditions, you're not going to get over a quarter to 30% uh, of its diet. Um is is gonna is are they gonna get what they need from forages, especially the birds that were like meat birds and that kind of stuff? You're gonna have to supplement with with feed, and really, when you look at the numbers, you're really supplementing with pasture. Uh, that doesn't diminish the the contributions pasture. I mean, if any anybody that's done this is that if you can cut out a quarter of your feed bill, man, that's the difference to uh, staying float and going under sometimes. But that uh, that publication, I think it's for free. Um, just go to atra.org. And uh, there's also another one someone asked about, Blackhead. Uh, I literally wrote the book on that. <laughs> so you can uh, find out about that disease. Um, uh, you can. There's also an Atra publication on that. And if you're not familiar with Atra, it's an awesome free clearinghouse of a lot of work um, in sustainable ag. Uh, yeah, we've grown some forage um, specifically for winter forage for the hens, um, the sunflower, wheat, um, rye, pea, vetch. And we found that we can cut out, you know, what would be worth maybe 20% of feed over two months on about two to four acres. So, you know, if we're able to work that into our program to, to plant more, we could get it to last longer. Of course, we're again dealing with the mud in the winter, so moving their trailers around on too much ground doesn't really pay off. But, you know, we spend $1,000 a ton on certified organic, no soy feed. So if we can cut down, and that's the stuff we buy, not the stuff we mill, by the way. Um, but if we can, you know, cut down 20, 15, 20% of that feed cost, it does pencil out for us. Um, so far, we've not extended that program over six to eight weeks. But that's the limit to what we've been able to benefit from it. And I can't tell you how it pencils out. It pencils out a little bit if you're paying that much for feed. Um, to develop a program around it, I don't know. It'd be interesting. One, one other thing. Oh, go ahead, Spence. <laughs> quality of the feed that it, like in the product, like I imagine her stuff is, is pretty awesome uh, with that amount of forage intake and is worth every bit the $8.00. Well, at this point, thank you all for your um, wonderful questions. There's quite a few that we didn't get to, and I apologize for that, but we make sure that uh, we will try to get you answers. Um, you see that I shared a link on the sidebar, our webinar link on our Fund of Farmer site that has our entire archive of these webinars. I will be posting the recording and the slides from this webinar um, for anyone to view at your leisure. Um, and I'm also gonna encourage you, please uh, take the survey that's gonna immediately follow this if you have any feedback or if you have questions that um, you'd like, you definitely need to be answered. That's another way you can get in touch with us and we'll forward it to the um, proper person. 
Um, I'd like to thank Homer, Chris, and Spence once again for all that you've shared. It's been truly one of our, our best webinars to date. Um, and uh, I encourage everyone to kind of join our email list so that you learn about future ones. So with that all said, I'm going to officially end this webinar. webinar. Um, I uh, hope you all have a good afternoon and evening and please stay in touch. Thank you so much.